Can you give it up for the worship team one time? Come on. Why don't you shake a hand, hug a neck, give a kiss, whatever is appropriate, and then get on back to your seat. Get on back to your We do have security on hand. We do have security on hand. If somebody tries to kiss you and you weren't wanting that, please let me know right now. Got to grab my sword. How's everybody feeling tonight? South Carolina. Okay. It's going to be hard. I'll give you a second to sit down and listen. How's everybody feeling tonight? I'm going to give a shout by faith. If you can't give it by anything else, give a shout by faith. Man, it is such an honor. It is such an honor to get to be here um, tonight. My name is Keenan Clark. If we have not had the privilege of meeting, um, and I traveled all the way here from the beautiful state of Tennessee. I have been able to say that for two weeks now, two weeks ago. Uh, my wife, myself, and our son, his name is August Rhodes Clark. Uh, we moved from Texas to Tennessee. We live in Franklin, Tennessee. Uh, right outside of Nashville, and uh, we flew here today, and it is just such a ridiculous privilege. The last time my wife and I were in South Carolina, we were on our honeymoon. So you could say, I like South Carolina. Woo! South Carolina brings up some good memories, brings up some good memories for me. Come on, girl, holler at your boy. Anyway, <laughs> thank you, baby, thank you, baby. By the way, my wife is in the room. Come on, can we honor Beth Clark? Babe, stand up, Get, let the church look at you. No? Babe, I'm under the unction of the Holy Ghost. You better obey me right now. Stand up and let him look at you, girl. Come on. Come on. That's my wife right there. Looking like a whole grain snack and um, very thankful for her. I have to say all the awkward things because uh, if I don't, then they will turn my mic off. Um, and like I said, we also brought our son, August Rhodes Clark. He is having his very first time in children's church right now. Typically, we have him in the service with us, um, but he is getting so out of hand. We said, we need somebody with a greater anointing um, than us to lay hands on him. They said, the child workers, will they have, a, they have quite the anointing. So he is with them. They've already texted Beth some like videos of him just like terrorizing everyone. So y'all pray for that boy. He is not saved. He is not saved. He is 11 months old, and he will be a year old on the 22nd of this month. Um, I say all that to say, I love getting to do ministry with my family. I love that we get to travel and share the glorious message of the gospel all over the country, even internationally. We've got some international things coming up, and it is a ridiculous privilege to be here tonight. My Bible says this. I don't know if yours does, but mine does. It says that we are to give honor where honor is due, that that's what we're called to do. That only God is worthy of worship, but there are some people who are worthy of our honor. And if you love your senior pastor, come on, Pastor Larry, would you put your hands together for him, making space in his church budget for things like this to begin to happen? Come on, YA would not be what it is if it wasn't for the vision of the man at the very top. And I'm also thankful for, for all the Tims, okay, from Tim Smith, come on, to Timmy, uh, Sheldon, thankful for all of them. Savannah, you guys have been incredible. We got to hang out with them this afternoon. What an incredible couple right here. Come on. You guys better honor them. You guys better love on them. Beth and I might steal them if you guys don't honor them. So, um, so wow, well, already getting booed. Well, that's a good thing for you. Good thing for you. But man, I am excited to be here and um, really excited. This is my first time to preach inside of 2024, and I'm ready to get in the Word. You guys ready? Did you bring a Bible to church? Or are you banking on me bringing one? You brought a Bible? I, got, I saw one Bible over there. Anybody actually got like a, a brick and mortar paper Bible? Hold it up like you just do care. Okay, awesome. We got the real Christians in the house. The rest of us, we got a digital sword. We got a digital sword. Hey, go to it. Ephesians chapter three. Ephesians chapter three. We're gonna look at two verses, verses 17 and 18. Ephesians chapter three. If you don't have a Bible, the Bible should be on the screen for you. I've got a very simple message on my heart. This is honestly a life message for me. I really do feel like this. If there's anything else that I want the world to hear, it is this right here tonight. Ephesians chapter three, we'll start at verse 17. It says this, Paul writes this, and I pray that you, listen, I know that this is the book of Ephesians. So obviously the apostle Paul who penned the book of Ephesians is writing 
to a church in Ephesus, ancient Ephesus. So I could understand why you would think that this is not about you, but you got to remember somebody much higher than Paul actually inspired what is written here in the book of Ephesians. So though Paul did not have your face in his mind when he wrote this, the Lord did. What I'm trying to get you to understand tonight is this you in Ephesians 3 actually is you. Paul says, and I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp. Somebody say to grasp. Five of you were obedient. Somebody say to grasp. To grasp. How wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. Paul says, I pray that you'd have power to grasp the ridiculous love of God. Tonight, I wanna to preach a very, very simple message that I'm calling this, hard to grasp. Hard to grasp. Have you ever given a friend some advice you ever given a friend some advice? That is a rhetorical question that would probably apply to most of us in here. I have given my friends um, some advice, some of which they are still living by today and some of which they discarded immediately, discarded immediately. But I'll never forget, I was in the ninth grade and my best friend, who has been my best friend pretty much right out the womb, all right? His name is Jonathan Mark Huffman. Uh, I was at his first birthday, okay? We are nearing 30 years old. This, is, this friendship has lasted nearly three decades, okay? This is a friendship. Jonathan came to me in the ninth grade and he said, um, um, Kenan, I kind of got eyes for this girl. I don't know if he actually said it like that, but I think it'd be funny if he said, I kind of got eyes for this girl. He was like, yo, Kenan, there's this girl. Uh, I'm kind of interested. I said, who is she? Because I'm thinking she probably goes to our church or she probably goes to our little Christian school. Mind you, I went to a private Christian school my entire life. So if you're looking at me a little bit strange tonight, um, that's why, all right? I went to a private Christian school, which just means I know more Bible, but yet got more problems than you, okay? I got some problems. Amen. All the Christian school kids are amen to me right now. So Jonathan comes up to me in the ninth grade. He says, Keenan, I like this girl. I said, who is she? He tells me her name and I'm not leaking her name tonight. She is getting no royalties off of this content. None whatsoever. Jonathan tells me her name and I said, never heard of her. He said, well, she, she doesn't, she isn't, she's not like, she doesn't go anywhere we go. I was like, okay. He said, but what do I, what do, I do, Keenan? She doesn't go to our church. She doesn't go to our school. I said, Jonathan, it's easy. You got to find her on Facebook. That's what I told him. Now we're in the ninth grade, okay? Facebook was brand new. Instagram was not a thing. IG was not around, okay? But your boy had Facebook. So I told Jonathan, you better find her on that new platform called Facebook. So Jonathan types her name in the search engine. She comes up and he says, okay, what do I do now? I said, bro, send her a friend request. So he clicked, drag, he, anybody remember when you actually had a mouse? Okay, Jonathan takes the mouse on the computer and he clicks send friend request. And now we've got to wait to see what said girl is going to do with said friend request, right? So we go about and lead our boring ninth grade lives, come back the next day to check the status of the friend request. And we get on her profile. And you know how when you send someone a friend request, it typically says friend request pending if they haven't accepted it? This did not say friend request pending. This said send friend request. Yeah. She straight up denied the friend request, okay? It was not pending. She had made up her mind, okay? She wasn't even like, I'm gonna leave this in the queue. Maybe I'll feel better about it. I'm gonna save this for a rainy day. Maybe in a low moment, I'll accept it, needing a little affirmation. She's like, I don't need any affirmation from you, okay? She says, sayonara, Jonathan Mark Huffman, okay? And so she obviously denied it. And Jonathan looks very dejected and confused, right? And he said, well, what do I do now? And I said, bro, send it again. And he said, what? I said, send it again. So Jonathan says, okay. So he takes the mouse, goes over, clicks send friend request. We come back the next day to check the status. Sure enough, it says send friend request. She chopped it down again. Jonathan looks at me and he's like, bro, we need to give up. I said, no, you're not. Send it again. I said, send that dang thing. She's playing hard to get, my man. Listen, I know women, okay? That's what I told him. I was like, in the ninth grade. I'm like, I know women, okay? 
And Jonathan's like, okay. So he sends the friend request again. Sure enough, we come back the next day. It says, send friend request. We do this for no word of a lie. We do this for a week, <laughs> seven days in a row. And on day seven, Jonathan looked at me and he said, bro, I think we're starting to look a little desperate. I said, Jonathan, I hate to break it to you, but we passed desperate like six days ago. And my name is not attached to any of this, okay? There is probably a police report floating around out there somewhere about you, okay? So in that moment, we decide to just throw her back into the ocean of Jonathan's love life, and she swam away very fast. Never saw her again, okay? But I tell you that ridiculous story because I honestly think there's a parallel here in Ephesians 3, because what I want you to notice is this, is it didn't matter how many times Jonathan sent the friend request, it was not gonna be until she on the other end accepted what Jonathan was sending that things were gonna be able to move any type of forward. And what I wanna call your attention to in the scripture we read tonight is Paul is not praying that God would love you. Paul's not sitting there in Ephesians chapter three saying, hey guys, I know you're really screwed up. So I need to pray that God would actually find it in his heart to love you. He's not praying that God would love you. He's praying that you would actually grab on to the love that God already sent. Because it doesn't matter. You listen to me. You have never known a moment on your, in your stay here on this little blue ball we call home. You've never known a moment outside of the love of God. There has never been a moment in which you have not been completely and totally loved by God. But it is not until you recognize that love and then reciprocate that love that things are beginning to move forward. Paul saying, I'm praying you'd be able to grasp the love of God. Did you notice what he said? He said, I'm praying. It's not his advice. Like he didn't open up the book of Ephesus and say, hey guys, you know what? My advice to you for the day, the tidbit of the day is you need to grasp the love of God. No, because Paul understands something about you and I. The love of God is the hardest thing to grasp. And it's not because the love of God is elusive. And it's not because the love of God plays hard to get. It's not because the love of God is here today, gone tomorrow. It's not because the love of God will hit you all weekend, try to text you all weekend, kind of leave you high and dry and then leave you on red on Monday. No, it's because when you get a good look at the love of God, but then you get a good look at you, you gotta remember you're still in the equation here. When you get a good look at a sovereign, holy, righteous God, and then you get a solid look at you, his love becomes very hard to grasp. When you know you, when you go everywhere with you, you know the church you, but you also know you on a Saturday night. You also know 2 a.m. you, not just 10 a.m. on a Sunday morning. And when you understand that you, the love of God becomes very hard to grasp. And this is why Paul says, I'm, gonna, I'm just gonna pray you'd be able to grasp it. Because you can't even ascertain the love of God without the help of God. You will never be able to grab onto it unless God somehow plants within you a seed called faith. And you are able to actually take his word over a history you have made of disappointing him. That's the juncture you're at tonight. Am I gonna continue to be dictated by the history of disappointing God or am I actually gonna be coerced by the love of God? And Paul says, I know it's hard. So I'm praying. I'm praying for you that you'd be able to grasp on. It reminds me of what Jesus said. I'm off my notes, but it reminds me of what Jesus said. He looks at Simon and he says, Simon, Simon, who he also called Peter. He says, Satan has asked to sift you like wheat. He says, but don't worry. I prayed for you. Do you know that Jesus is praying for you. We don't just have the prayer 
of the Apostle Paul. Jesus is the great intercessor. Jesus right now as we speak is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. And you know what he's doing? Your Bible says he's making intercession for you. That's fancy terminology for he's praying for you. Every time you wander off, he's pulling you back with an invisible string called prayer saying, hey, the devil wants you. The devil's called your name. The devil's got your number, but I'm praying for you. I'm praying that your faith would not fail. It's what Jesus tells Simon. Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift you like we, but I pray for you that your faith wouldn't fail. Because when you've got to stare at a loving God, but all you've got is a history of disappointing him, it is very hard to grab on, let alone just ascertain that he actually loves you. The love of God is hard to grasp. And there are four facets the apostle Paul names here in Ephesians chapter three. He says, he says this, I'm praying that you would grab on to the height, the depth, the width and the length of the love of God. And I would love to thoroughly preach all four of those because listen to me, there is some deep life-changing truth in all four of those. But for time's sake, I can only tackle one. And I honestly think out of those four, again, this is just Keenan Clark's opinion. When you get a chance to preach, you can change it. But in my own life, I genuinely think the thing that has been the hardest for me to grab onto has been the length of the love of God. Because I don't know about you, but I find myself asking questions like this. God, how long are you gonna put up with me? Like God, how long are you gonna continue to give me the same grace even though I commit the same sin over and over and over? You ever found yourself asking that? God, how long? There's got to be a day in which you're finally going to be like, yep, that's it. Or maybe you ask this, God, to what length are you actually willing to go in order to find me, rescue me, clean me, and redeem me? What's the length, God? Where's the city limit of your love? What are the boundaries? The, love, the length of the love of God is the thing I think I have the hardest time grasping over and over and over. And it's because I do this. I superimpose my limitations onto a limitless God. Do you do the same thing? I superimpose my response to myself onto God. And I think, God, if I would do it this way, you must do it this way. But God is nothing like you. He says, my ways are higher than your ways. My thoughts are higher than your thoughts. You know what that verse is about? You know what that verse is about? That verse, the context for that verse is mercy. God says, my thoughts on mercy are higher than your thoughts. My ways on mercy are higher than yours. That's, what, that's one of the scriptures we use when all of a sudden bad things happen to us and we think, well, you know, God's ways are higher than our ways. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. This is not something you can apply to whatever you want. You have to apply it to what the Bible is talking about. And the context is mercy. God is infinitely more merciful. He has more thoughts on how to be merciful to you than you can ever begin to understand. Listen to me. What I'm not saying tonight is that it's okay for you to continue to abuse that mercy. I'm not preaching some message that says God will love you no matter what you do. I am preaching that. But that's not the end of the story. Because if you come in contact with a love that you just want to use, you've not come in contact with love, you've come in contact with a concept. You've come in contact with a loophole, not love. What I'm talking about tonight 
is not just a theoretical concept called love. It's not just some neurotransmitters that we have given the definition love. I am talking about a man. I am talking about a person. I am talking about God incarnate who put on skin and bone, came as a baby, grew up in wisdom, stature, and favor with both God and man. He crawled upon a cross was stapled on your behalf, was pulled off of that cross, put into a tomb, sat there lifeless for three days while he, his soul was down in Hades, kicking the devil's rear, taking the keys to sin, hell, death, and the grave, came back into that body, resurrected, and then re ascended to the throne of God where he is in fact praying you'd believe this sermon tonight. I'm talking about that. I'm not talking about a concept. I'm not talking about an ism. I'm not talking about a religion. I'm talking about a man. And when you come in contact with the man, you can't abuse him. You can abuse a concept. You can exploit a loophole. But a man whose eyes burn with fire, whose hair is as white as wool, his feet are like burnished bronze. When you come in contact with that man, the last thing on your mind is how might I get away with what I've been doing? The length of the love of God's the hardest thing for me to grab onto. Have you ever thought about the perks that come with being God? There are definitely some perks. Okay, obviously there are some downsides. God's got to deal with a lot. But there are real, there are real perks. Like what I'm talking about, for, for instance, the perk I want to draw your attention to is the fact that God has this thing called foreknowledge. You understand that? Your Bible tells you this. God has foreknowledge. What foreknowledge is, is the ability to peek into the future. God sits outside of time and space. God knows what is coming down the pipe before it finally hits your plate. Isaiah 46.10, in fact, proves this. For God says this, I make known the end from the beginning. God says that. I make known. Again, this is another thing you got to understand. God's a talkative guy. Some of you feel like God doesn't want to talk to you. So you believe Jesus would die for you, but you don't think he wants to talk to you. Weird. That's some strange theology. You believe he'd die for you, but you don't believe he wants to talk to you. That falls apart really fast. I make known, I decree, I declare, I open up my mouth. What this is, is I prophesy the end, though it is still the beginning. What this is telling us is God has this thing called foreknowledge. Now, real briefly, imagine with me, I have foreknowledge. When God made me in his image, he made me a little too in his image. Didn't realize he put this gift in there. And all of a sudden, I don't have this, okay? But God gave me this thing called foreknowledge. And you come up to me after the service, and you're like, Keenan, and I go, yeah, what? And I just blow you off. You'd be like, you could probably tell yourself, oh, he didn't hear me. Like, <laughs> oh, maybe it's just a rough day. Guy had a long flight. He's got an 11-month-old. He hasn't slept in almost a year, okay? Like, the, you'd cut me a break. But then all of a sudden, you see me a little later. You go, Keenan! I do the same thing again. I blow you off again. At this point, there's now a history of this. You would probably, unless you're a non-confrontational person, you would probably come up to me and say, Keenan, hey, I can't help but notice every time I want to talk to you, you're like a pastor, bro. You're a man of the cloth. That's what they call us in the, in the olden days, men of the cloth. Check out this cloth I bought here tonight. Come on, somebody, that vintage drip, my man. Psalm 23. I love this joke. Somebody, I heard somebody say this one time. Turn in your Bibles to Psalm. Body once told me. Okay. Funniest thing I'd ever heard in church. But back to my analogy. Imagine with me that I have foreknowledge, right? I'm blowing you off constantly. You come up to me. You confront me. You're like, Kenan, what's this about? And you go, Kenan, is, did, I, Kenan did I do something? Did I do something to you? And I go, well, not exactly. It's not what you did, but it's what you're going to do. You're like, what I'm going to do? I'm like, yeah, I have this gift. It's called foreknowledge. And I peeked into your future. And I saw that two weeks from right now, you're going to say some nasty things about me. 
And to be honest with you, I know you ain't done it yet, but I'm kind of mad right now just because I know what's going to happen. I think I would have every right to treat you accordingly right now if I know what you are capable of. And this is why God didn't give Cain and Clark foreknowledge, because that's exactly how I'd use it. But God does have it. What I'm trying to draw your attention to tonight is if God is standing here tonight decreeing and declaring that he loves you, he already knows the stupid things you're going to think disqualify you two weeks from now. What I'm trying to tell you tonight is not only is God not holding your past over your head, he's not holding your future over your head either. God decreeing today that he loves you is proof he will still love you tomorrow. God knows about it. God knows what you're going to do. And I'm not saying, therefore, it is okay that you do it. I'm not drawing attention to you. I'm drawing attention to him. This sermon is about him. His goodness. His sufficiency. His longevity. So many times we talk ourselves out because we know what we're capable of. You know what Psalm 136 says? Psalm 136, some of you are familiar with it. Throw it up, it says this. I give thanks to the Lord for he is good. Now real quick, why do we give thanks to God for being good? It's because God is still good even when I'm not. Do you understand? God does not take his social cues from you. What I'm trying to say is God does not let you dictate who he is gonna be. God is not good to you on the days you are good to him and then bad to you on the days you are bad to him. God stays good even in the face of you having a rough day. That's not even what I wanted to point out to you. That was for free. Psalm 136 verse one says this. Let's start back up. His love endures forever. Now, if you grew up in the church like me, this is a verse that you've heard a kajillion times. The steadfast love of the Lord endureth King James, little flex, forever. The love of God endures. But can we pause real quick? Let's slow this sermon down. That's a weird word to use. Endures? I don't know about you, but I only really throw that word around when I am talking about things I do not enjoy. If you hear me talking about something I am enduring, it means I don't enjoy it. It's not exactly riveting. It's not exactly the highlight of my day. Like one of, one of the worst things that could ever happen to me as a husband would be if you came up to my wife, Beth, after the service and you're like, hey, Pastor Beth, Pastor Beth, I gotta ask you, what's it like being married to Kenan? And all of a sudden I perk up because you know I'm an eavesdropper and I'm like listening for what she's gonna say and I hear her go, I endure it. That would be horrible. That would be a catastrophic Failure to me as a husband. I don't want her to say, I endure being married to Kenan. I want her to say, I enjoy being married to Kenan. But what you have to understand is God didn't sign up to love just the parts of you he can enjoy. God's love signs up that says, even in the face of things I am gonna have to endure, the parts of you I don't like, the decisions I never will rubber stamp, the parts I'm never gonna bless, I will still stick around, I will still endure. Newsflash, God does not love everything you do. But God understands something you and I have a very hard time understanding, and there is a difference between what you do and who you are. God loves who you are. Who you are is made in his image. Some of you don't realize that tonight. That's why God cares about what you do with your body. That's why God cares about what you, comes out of your mouth. That's why God cares about what you entertain yourself with, because you are made in his image. God cares what you identify as. Can I go there? God cares which pronouns you associate with yourself. Like it's not just some little thing that God's like, yeah, utilize that feature on Instagram, go for it. It matters to God. It's a telltale sign. To me, can I just be honest? I don't know anybody in here, so I can go here. I can't go there at my own home church, but I can go here tonight because I don't know any of y'all. 
it is a red flag if they've got their pronouns in their bio. Red flag. I'm not saying you just cast immediate judgment. I say proceed with caution. Because if they have found it necessary to let the world know, here's what I identify as, there's a ton of other things they also have weird thinking on that you don't know yet. If they're willing to advertise that, even if their bios match up with what God would, their, their bios, their pronouns match up with what God would say their pronouns are, it's still weird they even feel the need to display them. That's for free. Some of you, I'm saving you a lot of heartache tonight. God cares about these things. You're made in his image. And God says, even though you do things I will never bless, I will endure. I'll stick around. Can you imagine the things the love of God has had to endure in your life? I want you to think back right now to some of the moments that if you could have eyes in the spirit, you would see God sitting there enduring watching you look at it again, watching you send it again. I didn't come here to shame anybody tonight. I'm not trying to shame at all, but I did come to tell the truth. Can you imagine what the love of God has had to endure? It's sad that God would put on skin and bones, start over as a baby. My, well, I've thought about this. Why did God start over as a baby? He made a full-fledged man when he made Adam. That proves he can do it. Adam was two seconds old, but looked 30 years old. Why didn't, why didn't they just do that to Jesus? But bam, there he is. It's because Jesus didn't want you to be able to say, there's a season of my life you can't identify with. So he says, okay, I will walk through every season, every year, every second, the same way you did, so that you might see what the book of Hebrews says is true, that we don't have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who was tempted in every way in which we were, yet he did not sin. Jesus endured it all. And I don't think there's a single thing on this little blue ball we call home that God has had to endure more than our rejection. There's nothing the love of God has had to endure more than the rejection of people he bled and died for. Can you imagine coming down to earth, putting on skin and bone, letting Romans Tear your body to shreds, allowing people who recite the Torah day after day, but when they meet the man who wrote the Torah, they say, crucify him. Allowing all that to happen to you, being stapled to a tree, put in a grave, resurrecting, ascending to the right hand of God, praying for you for the last 2,000 years in eternity, and then you get here and you say, I don't want it. Can you imagine that? No one has had to endure more rejection than God. And right here, this is where I begin to land the plane. I'm saying begin to land the plane. So if I could have somebody play behind me, that would be amazing. God has had to endure our rejection. And listen to me, your Bible is littered with places where this is on full display. The gospel is demonstrated on every page of the Bible. Do you understand that? Every page of the Bible preaches one message and it's Jesus is enough. Your entire Bible preaches it, not just Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. The entire Bible, every book, Leviticus preaches the cross. Everything does. And there's a place in the Old Testament where the love of God, the enduring love of God shows up on full display. And the sad thing is most of the church doesn't even realize it's in their Bible. There's a story found in the pages of the Old Testament. Most of the church, for whatever reason, has remained ignorant of. I feel like this is a life story for me to tell. Changed my life. I went for decades following Jesus, never knowing this story was in my Bible. It's because it's racy. It's PG-13 at best. 
There's an Old Testament book, a minor prophet called Hosea. And in the small Old Testament book called Hosea, Hosea is a prophet living 750 years before Jesus would ever take his first breath. Hosea is the prophet of the nation of Israel. Now, mind you, a prophet is one who speaks on behalf of God to the entire nation. What I'm trying to get you to see is Hosea is a really big deal. He is God's man. He's God's man for the hour. He's the preacher of his day. And God comes to Hosea and he says, Hosea, um, I have an assignment for you. If you would dare to accept it, I, well, I want you to marry a prostitute. That's what God tells Hosea. I want you to marry, you, my Bible says it like this, a woman of whoredom. I want you to marry a whore. I want you to marry a prostitute. I want you to marry a woman who right now, it's not just part of her past, right now is actively selling her body for some cheap change. Go marry her right now. And you know what's crazy? Hosea doesn't bat an eye. You know what this tells me? It tells me that following the voice of the Lord, if you do it long enough, you will have a yes in your heart before you even know the question God's gonna ask. That's what mature faith looks like. The answer is yes, God. Now, what's your question? I'm not trying to see if it fits inside of the safe confines of my American dream. I'm not going back and looking at my vision board and seeing how does the assignment God has given me fit my idea? Does it fit inside of my white picket fence? It's God, the answer is yes. Now, what's your question? Hosea says yes, and he finds a prostitute to marry, one specifically by the name of Gomer. Hosea, Hosea marries this woman named Gomer, she's a prostitute, and the Bible says that they begin to have a family. They have a little boy, they have a little girl, they end up having another little boy, they have three children, your Bible says so, a boy, girl, boy. We're not really sure how long they're living together, we're not really sure how old the children get, but we do know at some point, Something happens. I'd like to imagine that Hosea wakes up one night. He rolls over to see if his wife's awake and to his shock and surprise, Gomer's not in bed. Gomer's not there. He gets slightly concerned as any good husband would. He jumps out of bed, starts going through the house. You know, maybe one of the kids is sick. So he starts going through all the kids' rooms. All the kids are fast asleep. He goes inside the kitchen. Maybe she's cooking a little breakfast. Gomer's nowhere to be found. At this point, he starts to panic. He's checking everywhere. He's checking cupboards. He's checking the bathroom, maybe the backyard. Until finally, the reality of the situation he is in settles in. She's gone. She's left him. He's now a single dad with three kids. And to add insult to injury, the prophet of Israel. Not only does he have to leave the, lead these three little children, he has to lead an entire nation. You can only imagine the thoughts that are going in through his mind at this moment. I'm supposed to be a beacon of hope. I'm supposed to be the man of God. I'm supposed to be a, a, a leader. I'm supposed to tell these people what God says. Keep them in line and I can't even keep my wife at home. Same thoughts you would have if it were you. We're not really sure how long Hosea lives this way. I'm sure he had some dark nights. I'm sure he had some trying moments. We're not really sure how long Hosea lives this way, but we do see this in the pages of scripture that God comes to Hosea and he says, um, Hosea, I've got a plan. Hosea's like, God, it's about dang time. It is about dang time. And God says, here's the plan. Go find her. Go, go find her. Go find her. And when you do, marry her again. Marry her again. Marry her again. So Hosea says, yes, sir. He goes and starts looking all over town. You can imagine he starts checking her favorite boutiques, favorite cafes, favorite restaurants, until finally Hosea has checked high and low, and there is no place left to look but where he found her to begin with. 
He's got to go back to that part of town. If you know what I mean, he's got to go back to the other side of the tracks. He's got to go to the local red light district where the prostitution rings run wild. Now, mind you, while he is going looking in the red light district, while he is knocking on doors of brothels, seeing if he can find his wife, he is the most famous figure in his day. And he's not just famous as a YouTuber for giving you tidbits. He's the man of God. His face is associated with holiness. And the man whose face in that day, who's, who is associated with holiness, has to go parading that face around the local red light district. Can you imagine how awkward this is? A man of God having to stoop to walking streets that are unworthy of him. Sound familiar? Do you know what the Hebrew word for grace means? It means to stoop. The Hebrew idea of the grace of God is that God in grace stooped. He came to our level and never compromised who he was. Hosea's got to go parading his face around. And it's really not too far-fetched to imagine that he had to interact with some people, namely probably some guys. A guy is only in that part of town for one thing. A man is only in that neighborhood for one reason. And Jose, you can imagine, he's got to interact with some dudes who are in the local red light district. They're in an area that is filled with prostitutes. I can imagine that he walks up to this dude and taps him on the shoulder. Man whips around. He says, hey, my name's Hosea. I'm looking for my wife, Gomer. Have you seen her? And all of a sudden, when the name Gomer leaves Hosea's mouth, you can imagine this man's face is filled with regret, shame. He said, what's her name? Her name's Gomer. Have you seen her? Yeah. Um, I have. Um, is a few nights ago, a few streets down. Yeah, I saw her. But I paid her. I paid her. You can imagine Jose in this moment is like, hey, I don't need to know about a few nights ago, and I certainly don't want to know about a few streets down. Where is she right now? I'm looking for her now. He's like, dude, I don't know. It's a few nights ago, a few streets down. Well, if you find her, tell her her husband is looking. All of a sudden, Hosea begins to walk the streets, the back alleys, until your Bible tells you this, that Hosea rounds a corner and he walks up on a sea of people in a town square. The sea of people are all pressed in around the platform. And standing on the platform is none other than Gomer. Hosea walked up in this moment on what most biblical scholars believe to be an auction. A sex slave auction. Gomer in this moment is being sold at top dollar to the highest bidder as a sex slave. Now you can imagine this is a rough crowd. And the men who occupy and make up this crowd want to know what their money is getting them. So Gomer in this moment would have been completely naked. She would have been completely exposed for these men to look at her naked body and yell out a dollar amount they believe it's worth. Can you imagine being a husband, standing next to a man, staring at your naked wife on a stage, yelling out a dollar amount he would give to be with her? I cannot. Men are yelling out dollar amounts. Hosea begins to push through the crowd. He says, excuse me, excuse me, excuse me, excuse me, until finally he makes it to the edge of the platform where Gomer and the auctioneer stand, and he's got to get the attention of the auctioneer. He says, sir, um, sir, I don't know if you realize this, but she's my wife. The auctioneer probably says, I don't know who you think she is, but she's mine and she's for sale. Here's the price. Does he have to outbid a few other bidders? Maybe. Until finally we see that Hosea pays 15 pieces of silver. 
and five bushels of barley. Now to you, those seem like inconsequential numbers. They hold massive consequence theologically. 15 speaks in theology of divine rest while five theologically is the number associated with the grace of God. 15 and five, rest and grace. But it goes so much deeper because it's not just 15 and five, but it's silver and it's barley. Silver represents heaven. It represents something of, of royal significance. While barley represents earth, it represents something temporal. Listen to me. Jesus is both divine and human at the same time. He is both God and man. And what he did on the cross brought us rest and grace. What I'm trying to get you to understand is this. Hosea is prophetically paying for his wife with something he doesn't even have the wherewithal to understand is symbolic of Jesus. The Bible's not boring. You're boring. The Bible, according to the book of Hebrews, the word of God is sharper than a double-edged sword, penetrating even to the dividing of soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and intents of the heart. The Bible is the only book that while you read it, it is reading you. The gospel's on full display. 15 pieces of silver, five bushels of barley, that'll be the price. All of a sudden, Hosea begins to go to get the payment or make an IOU for the payment. However, he decides to pay for the payment. And I'll be honest with you. Had I been lucky enough to be one of Hosea's guys, had I rolled with him, I'd have been down to roll with him. I'll be honest with you. I'd been like, yeah, bro, we're going to storm the castle and we're going to get your girl back. That's, that's a true bro right there. Someone who's willing to get your girl back with you. I'd have, been a, I'd, I'd have been one of his boys. But it's right about now that I would have piped up. I'd have said, Hosea, hold on. Before you give this man any money, I need you to remember something, my man. Gomer's your wife. What I mean is, she already belongs to you. Like, why are you paying for what already belongs to you? You have a marriage certificate. You have proof of this thing. She is yours. But here's what Hosea didn't know, but God did know, was that 750 years after this moment, God was going to send his son into our planet to purchase back what already belonged to him. You know, your Bible says this in Psalm 24, that the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. This means that everything belongs to God. All Satan can do is offer a cheap counterfeit. It's God's. What I'm trying to tell you tonight is God holds the patent on your life. Whether you acknowledge him as your creator or not, he does not need your acknowledgement to remain your creator. You get the benefit when you acknowledge it. But regardless, he still holds the patent on your life. This is why it's sick and twisted when the enemy tries to tell good Bible-believing Christians they don't belong to God. It ticks me all the way off. When Satan tries to tell you you don't belong to God, because you know what? If you are a born-again believer, not only are you God's by design, but you are his by purchase. You don't belong to God, you are doubly God's. You're his because you're made in his image, but then you're his because you've been bought back by the precious, sacred, scarlet blood of Jesus. Oh, come on. Somebody better give God a big amen in this place tonight. If you know you're a blood, a blood boss son or daughter, I'm tired of the enemy picking on the church. I'm tired of the accuser of the brethren constantly being allowed to live up to his name. You know what Revelation 12, 11 says? They overcame him, the accuser of the brethren, by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. Amen. It's time you get a little bit of confidence in your relationship with God. It's time that the church knows who she is again. So Hosea takes the payment out. He pays for the auctioneer goes sold to the highest bidder, Hosea. 
And all of a sudden, you can imagine Gomer is escorted to the edge of the platform where Hosea eagerly awaits the reunion with his wife. Now we can only imagine what is going through Gomer's mind in this moment. She never dreamed Hosea would come here, let alone pay the price of the auction. She never dreamed he'd come here, let alone fork over the payment. She no doubt believes in her heart. That's as good as he's gonna be. Now I'm gonna, now I'm gonna get it. You can imagine she begins to emotionally brace herself for the tongue lashing she knows she deserves. But what I wanna call your attention to is what Hosea chapter three and verse three tells us about their reunion. The very first time Hosea is able to say anything to his wife, he says this, Hosea chapter three, verse three. And I said to her, you must dwell as mine for many days. You shall not play the whore or belong to another man. Listen to this, so will I also be to you. This is not a, hey, we're gonna go home and just see how the next few days go. If you can be a good girl, maybe I'll let you have a seat at the table, even call you publicly my wife again. That's not what we see here. This is not a, hey, let's just see how it works out. This is a, so shall I also be to you. When we would expect a rebuke, when we would expect shame, guilt, condemnation, and her past to be collected and thrust into her face, what does Hosea do? He begins to renew his vows to her. That's what we have right here in Hosea chapter three, verse three. This is a vow renewal. And it's not Gomer saying, thanks for buying me back. Here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna live up to it. I'll never do this again. It's Hosea initiating. Gomer hasn't even found the faith to muster up one word. She couldn't fend for herself, but not only did Hosea come, not only did he purchase her, but he spoke a better word over her than she ever thought she'd ever hear again. And my Bible says yet again in the book of Hebrews that the blood of Jesus speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. The blood of Abel cried out, avenge me. And the blood of Jesus cries out, it is finished. It's done. It's from this day forward. For better or for worse, for richer or poorer, in sickness and in health, from this day forward. Not that day, the day you screwed up. From this day. I felt like somebody needed to hear the gospel tonight. Some of us who have been in the church for a long time still need the gospel. It's the simplicity of the gospel that is its power. It's our attempt to overcomplicate it and mingle gospel and religion that leaves people bound says I don't know about that Jesus I've heard the sermon but when you hear the simplicity of just the, the tried and true gospel I'm telling you when you see the man everything in this world grows strangely to him in the light of his glory and his grace I'm telling you I've met a man I don't follow this book because my parents taught me that's what was right. There was a season in my life that that was the best I could do. My parents told me this was the truth and I just took them at their word that Jesus was the son of God. But you know what, eventually it wasn't just my parents' word and I heard his word. I heard his voice and I saw his eyes that burned with a fire that looked like the hue of Kenan Clark. And I was never the same. And I'm telling you, when you allow it to transcend just some ink on pages and it becomes blood in veins, you'll never look back. When this word becomes incarnate to you, where it's not just some dusty old book and some local religion, but it's a man, I've heard his voice. No, I don't, I, I know I've never seen Jesus with my physical eyes. Jesus says this to Thomas, he said, blessed are you, for you've believed. But even more blessed are those who are coming who believe yet they've never seen. You know who Jesus is talking about? He's talking about me. 
He's saying, Thomas, you had to see the nail prints in my hands. You had to thrust your hand to where the spear went into my side. But man, bless this Keenan Clark because he believes in me though he's never thrust his hand to where the spear went into my side. Though he's never put his finger in the nail hole, he still knows the nail holes are there. And I'm wondering if you might step over the line and become one of those who Jesus would call blessed because you believe though you haven't seen, but you've heard the sweet whisper. You've heard the gospel in its simplicity and you know beyond a shadow of a doubt tonight, you are Gomer. Let me make it abundantly clear, in case there was some confusion, you're Gomer, I'm Gomer. The Bible says we have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. There is not a one of us who can stand in our own righteousness, not a one. We've all fallen too short, but Jesus came to do for you what you could never do for yourself. He brings rest from having to work for your righteousness and grace because you never could. And right now we're gonna invite the band back up and I'm gonna invite you to bow your head and close your eyes. I want us to have a moment of privacy and concentration. Listen to me, I feel a holy spirit of the Lord in this room. May the fear of the Lord come over you right now in Jesus' name. A reverential fear and awe of God. May it come over you right now. I wanna create a quiet moment where somebody might say, you know what, I feel that tug. I feel the invisible string of the prayer. Jesus is praying for me and it's tugging at my heart. I know that I'm Gomer. Maybe it's a small compromise. Maybe a woman of whoredom is a little extreme of an example for what you feel you've been up to, but you know on some level, guess what? Sin is sin to God. You and I are the ones who categorize it. God does not. God sees it as a transgression. He sees it as a violation. He sees it as missing the mark. That is the literal definition of sin, to miss the mark. It is an archery term. And though you and I categorize it as big and small, God just sees it as outside of what he's called you to do. He sees it as disobedience. And if you would say, Kenan, I'm living in disobedience. There's an area of my life I'm living in compromise. Some of you, it is no accident I am preaching on sexual sin tonight. It's not an accident that I'm dealing with someone who went back to an old promiscuous lifestyle. Some of you under the sound of my voice, you've been dabbling in sexual promiscuity and you know it. You can't stop looking at things on the internet. You're struggling with masturbation. You can't get over it. You're fooling around with your girlfriend. You have homosexual tendencies, homosexual desires that you've never acknowledged and you've never brought into the light. And God's saying, I love you too much to let you stay hidden. I'm sending Jesus, who is the true Hosea, to your back alley tonight. Or maybe it's something small. Maybe it's bitterness. Maybe it's pride. Thinking, well, I'm so much better than everything he just described. I haven't dabbled in those ever, maybe for a long time. It's called the sin of pride. And it is the hardest sin to get saved from. It's not impossible. It's just the hardest one. It's the original sin. And you would say, Kenan, I know I need this, Jesus. I know I need a fresh touch of the love of God. I need the hand of God on my life again. If I have described anything, or you just feel that gentle tug from God, that you need to get right with the Lord tonight. Square things away. Say yes to him again. To grab on to the height, the length, the width, and the depth of the love of God. If that's you, I want you to shoot your hand up right now as a sign of surrender and faith. I'm gonna pray for you. Shoot your hand up right now. If you need what I'm talking about, come on, don't miss a moment. Faith, faith, faith. Step out in faith. If you know I'm talking to you, raise your hand. Leave it up, leave it up, leave it up, leave it up. 
I'm gonna ask you to be bold. If your hand is up right now, would you come to this altar right now? I believe there's something significant that takes place. Come on, I saw you, come on, come on, come forward, come forward. Don't miss your moment, don't miss your moment. If your hand is up, you need to get out of your seat, you need to come to this altar. Well, you can think, oh, well, they're gonna judge me. They're gonna assume it's this, they're gonna assume it's that. That's called pride and you need to come anyway just to deal with that alone, let alone what you're actually dealing with. Find some space at this altar, kneel at this altar. I want everybody to find a place. I want everybody to find a place at this altar. There's a level ground at the foot of the cross. If you would say, Kenan, I need what you're talking about tonight. I need a fresh encounter with the love of God. Somebody, you just feel stale. You just feel stale. It's not even like you're dealing with deep, dark sin, but you just haven't had an encounter with the Lord in some time. If that's you, come now. Come now. You're saying, Ken, I just feel stale. I just feel stale. Get down to this altar right now. Get down to this altar. There's something special that takes place at the foot of the cross. I think there are some some leaders who you know you're a leader at YA, you're a leader in this church, but listen to me, you carrying a badge of leadership does not make you off limits to the devil. If you even would say, ah, I don't even know if I wanna go up there because I'm in leadership, but you know I'm preaching to you tonight, you need to get to this altar. The lead, I honestly feel like revival is on the other side of leaders acknowledging they need Jesus. We get so busy leading the church that we quit setting the example. Oh, all y'all need the altar call. All y'all need them to lay their hands on you. All y'all need pray for. Can I be honest with you? Sometimes it's Keenan Clark who needs his, his, his life prayed over. Sometimes it's Keenan Clark who needs to kneel at an altar, not just to preach a sermon where people kneel at an altar, but I gotta go to the altar myself. Come on, we need some leaders. I feel it strong if you say Kenan in some way, whether you've been dabbling or something or there's even just an apathy that's come over your life, you need to come up to this altar. Right now, if you are a leader and you didn't answer this altar call, I want you to come and lay your hands on some people right now. If you know you're in leadership, you have the blessing of the leadership to do this, I want you to come forward now and we're gonna begin to lay our hands, lay our hands, lay our hands. The band's gonna play. Hey, those of you who didn't answer this altar call, you have the most to worship God for. You're not in need of whatever this is. That's why you didn't answer. You're evidently in a really great place. So we ought to have the best praise coming from those who are still left in the seats. Not an anemic praise, not an, a pathetic praise. We ought to have the best praise because you evidently are still stuck in your pride or you know that you're set free and you're ready to go to bat on behalf of those who are up here. So right now, come on, let's just begin to stir this up. Let's begin to stir this up, come on. If you know how to pray in the spirit, I want you to pray in the spirit. If you don't know how to pray in the spirit, pray as you know how. Come on, we're gonna lay our hands. The Bible says that as, the, as we lay our hands on people, they will be delivered, that demonic strongholds will be destroyed in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Come on, let's lay our hands. Let's lay our hands.